teaser reel that plays in the beginning of every episode. Like a blooper teaser reel. Wow, we gotta have like a badass. A couple song. zingers or something. A couple bad, like, uh, have the, uh, I don't know, what's his song there? Uh, Fred Bear playing, and then just do like a slideshow of like our, our deer, <laughs> pictures of us and our deer. We could do that. I could, I got a whole thing. I was playing around with the software a little bit, trying to cut and paste some stuff so we can maybe make a little intro so that could be playing while people start tuning into the episode and stuff like that. That'd be badass. So, and kind of. That's what's nice for like the podcast format is that can be like the, every episode lead into what's going on with the show. So, welcome back, everybody. Hundred Proof White Tails down here on February seventh, twenty twenty four, and uh, got a nice little docket tonight of little topics we came up with, stuff we were talking about before the show started, and yeah, we'll see what gets brought up. Yeah, absolutely. So, like always, let us know where you're tuning in from. And uh, drop your questions down below and topics, comments, all the above. You know, we want these to be live, interacting, fun episodes. And if you haven't, you can check us out on Spotify, Apple Podcasts. Listen to us at work, where it's a little bit easier to do than on YouTube and stuff live. And mm-hmm. catch what you missed. Yeah. So. We're getting pretty high tech around here now. Trying, dude. Trying. To. Trying. Doing the best that, best that I can. All these hats. These hats that uh, we are uh, promising, these knit hats are still in the works. The lady that is uh, designing them and putting them together for us is having a little difficulties with her machine at the moment. So, if anybody has any other suggestions, we <laughs> are gonna be. We're still a little open to the it'll idea. It'll be ninety degrees when we get our knit hats. So maybe beginning of next, we'll get them, and then beginning of the next deer season, we'll advertised in it <laughs> yeah maybe maybe we do have a new batch of stickers coming in because we're down i'm down to my last like three i think i still got a dozen in my truck but yeah we're down to the last bit and we have the uh sip and stroll next saturday the 17th yep so i wanted to have a I'm, fresh batch of stickers for that I'm good for that by the way good i meant to tell you that sweet so yeah so that's what we got coming up for events or whatever i had my wife's baby shower this weekend and then the following weekend um, we have the sip and stroll on Saturday down there in Phelps, which tickets are still available and the link, uh, is over on the Facebook page. So with a couple of our pictures from last nice couple of seasons, that we've check done out there. beautiful Phelps, New York and, uh, sample some wine, beer, whiskey. They got snack snacks and yep. It's a fun little walk. Yep. So if you are bet- going between smoking tails, which is one of the stops, obviously, and the Phelps Art Center, which is the church, which is where we poured last year. We're actually going to be in the building between those two. Uh, the art gallery, which is the old country lawyer's place. We're going to have a little sign out front that says tasting in here and all that stuff, too. So don't worry about that. You'll be able to find us. But that's where we're going to be at. We'll be in the old um, country lawyer's office building, which is now a art gallery. Mm-hmm. Yeah, last year cool. went really well, I thought. Yeah. Yeah, no, looking forward to it. And uh, a couple of our friends popped into K&M, the uh, husband and wife that bought our hoodie last year at the thing. Oh, really? Yep. Yep. Nice. They popped in, said, hey, saw that they said that they saw that we were going to be there at K&M. And, and we told them, yeah, we'll be here every first first Friday of the month for those episodes there with the show. So, yeah, thanks yeah. to K&M for helping us out the way they do. Yeah. Yeah. Helping us promote and helping them promote. and. Good time, but anyway, so uh, topics for tonight. I don't know where you want to start, Nate. What do you think? Well, I know, I guess we pick up, I guess, where uh, where we're at, where I left. Well, I haven't been on in two, three weeks. Mm-hmm. The last time I was on, we were talking about some habitat work and uh, seeding food plots and stuff, and this is the first year that I am kind of really digging into the food plot thing. I've Mm -hmm. never really had an opportunity to experiment with that, uh, besides with you and some of your plots. But uh, you and me talked back and forth of what we think would be the best option for what I'm doing, and we uh, brought up the frost seeding thing. And I think it's what we're going to do. We're going to experiment with the 100-proof spring mix. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, you're doing an experiment plot, and we're experimenting with my plot with it. But uh, a lot of people are wondering, from what I remember, about what exactly frost seeding is and how it actually works. So <clears throat> I read an article in the uh, um, New York Outdoor News, if anybody is tuning in gets that, it's in there. But uh, I thought that the, the guy explained it perfectly. And it really helped me understand the process of it because I, I got, I had the idea, but I was really understanding like how it actually works, how the seed actually gets into the ground, and so basically what it's saying is like you know you have those frosty mornings like in early season, later in bow season, I guess, towards the end of October where you start getting a frosty morning, and basically what when you're walking in and you're expecting it to be a quiet walk and you think it should be, but you start walking across this, your food plot or whatever you're going in or even the um, logging trail, whatever. Um, it's just these super loud crunches underneath your feet and you're not stepping on sticks. You're not stepping on leaves. You, you've already planned on all that. You got it all cleared out. And it almost you almost get that feeling of how how loud it is in them quiet cold mornings when that that crunch and what that crunch is underneath your feet is actually um, the moisture in the ground freezing. So if you go out on a frosty morning or where the ground's frozen, you'll find these little ball like ant hills that rise up out of the ground. And what that is is when um, water freezes it actually increases in size by like 10 percent like the volume of it actually expands there you go like these were even you see how that hump it froze and that um that cube froze up it expanded so when water freezes it actually expands expands nine to ten percent of its area liquid size and and when the moisture does that in the ground it expands and it creates those little i always thought they looked like little ant hills mm -hmm. those little ball things yeah, and it's it that's up. the moisture in the ground freezing expanding and creating these little hills that when you step that crunch is the frozen water and that's heaved up that's mm -hmm. heaved up so when that happens you go through and you do whatever you got to do to your food plot, whether you're just covering uh, bare spots or you're going to go through and drag it like I plan on doing and reseeding the entire thing. Um, well, when the moisture in the ground freezes and you get that little bit of rise out of the soil and you broadcast that seed into it, well, when it thaws, the sun comes out and the ground starts thawing out. The moisture dissipates and the soil that rose up will kind of fall down over the seed mm -hmm. and that's how your seed will get covered yep so i thought it was a really cool read just short article i think it took me five minutes to read it yep but it was uh, the way he described it is i think i basically just told you the whole article but yep. it i it really yep. kind of gave me a good visual and a good snapshot of, of what what you know how it, the process actually works and yep. uh so yeah so that's one of the things i wanted to bring up and share with you guys because it definitely helped me understand that process a little better yeah and some of the big keys with the frost seeding is obviously timing i would say probably anywhere getting now now that we are getting those cold frozen mornings, mornings. again um and they're thawing out during the day thawing out during the day this is a good time the similar conditions to what we're experiencing right now let's just say that um, are we going to get these conditions in March? I don't know. <laughs> I wish I could tell you and, you know, forecast that out for you. But they're saying we are going to dip down into some colder temps here next week and get some snow, which, of course, how it always falls out. That's my on-call week for plowing again. Mm -hmm. And this frost seeding, obviously, you want to make sure that whatever you're broadcasting out there to frost seed is cold hardy. Yeah, and it's, your, it's a species that will work for that well. You need the seed to survive. Like, if you put your... I believe corn, beans. Yeah. So you broadcast that something like that out there. They're not cold hardy. They need the soil to be a certain temperature mm -hmm. for them to actually germinate. Yeah. And if you 
broadcast them out there now, they're going to rot and right. Or you got, got a lot of a chance. You got a lot of squirrels, turkeys, all sorts of other stuff yeah, that'll enjoy it. Up through, for you take too. them before they actually get in the ground. Yeah, but, that's a good point. So some of the stuff that's really good frost seedable stuff is like chicory, clover, yeah. um, alfalfa. You can have decent results with. Um, I would recommend more doing that in the spring, like a mud seeding rather than that. Um, just because, or fall plant it, like you do your clovers and stuff like that. Which all this stuff that we're putting into um, the plot, the, you're the, your uh, your spring mix, mm -hmm. 100 proof spring mix, is all cold hardy stuff. Yeah, it's all stuff that's meant to be basically frost seed. It's meant to be because yep. one of your big things when I first met you and we started hanging out was the no till plot, really. Mm -hmm. It's going through and it's kind of, it's, along those same bases yeah yeah so yeah we can dive into no-till and stuff like that more but some of the stuff that um we can't put into uh brassicas here for another year well it'd be two probably two seasons um you had a mold issue you know we had that um, white spot fungus uh, i don't know if it was that or mix of powdery mildew or what it was but it was it was having a, a high percentage of it in the soil composition so we're getting away a little bit away from the no-till scratching up some of the plots um, a couple of them might be corn this year i got to talk to dad i would actually like to have dad on the show to flush out some of these projects real time um i think that'd be a cool episode get a different spin and a different you know viewpoint on it and see how we bounce each other's ideas off each other with it um but yeah so we got a bunch of stuff you know kind of in the works we got to sit down and do that and then uh yeah, a lot of stuff going forward. I would like to trim my apple trees. Um, I'm hoping they don't well, bud this is, out. This is the time of year to do that, right? Yeah, I'm hoping we don't get uh, bud out here for the next two days. Hopefully it really doesn't get up in those mid to upper 50s because um, it, it could push some buds, and then we get that cold snap next week. It could do some damage for those those buds for this upcoming uh, yeah. apple season. So I'd be uh... – tough year for the apple farmers yeah we'll see you know usually it's more that late frost where they're uh where the flowers have already emerged out but you can get some damage to new growth on your butt ends too um this time of the year especially with kind of these warm thaws especially with that kind of a jump 30s and 40s they stay pretty pretty dormant but when you're talking mid to upper 50s for you know a day or two uh it could definitely uh could definitely change some things up so and then when it comes to the fertilizer side of it, um, we pulled some soil samples. Mm -hmm. I went out and got a soil sample. You got some on a bunch of yours. Client pieces, yeah. And uh, sent out a big batch. They're cheaper to send out in a big batch. Yeah, <laughs> sending them out so we have a better idea of what the soil mm -hmm. composition is and to give us a better idea of what we need to put into it, if anything. And, um, I yeah. guess, I guess, I mean, you just, you would broadcast the frost seeding and broadcasting the fertilizer out this time of year is kind of yeah, just I mean, as effective, right? Yeah, I would say that um, you could, fer uh, you could either foliar ap apply fertilizer if you wanted to go that route with it with like a sprayed fertilizer, a liquid, a liquid fertilizer, um, that way. Pelletized. You, you could know, do pelletized. That all that'll stick to the ground better mm -hmm. you're not going to get so much carried away yep but um yeah and then you got lime obviously lime adjustments best time to lime is right now you know meaning like today versus like not doing it um getting that ph right because you can spread all the fertilizer you want but if your ph isn't right for those soil nutrients to be absorbed and utilized in the soil you're just basically throwing money away when you're fertilizing um that is one of the things about like a foliar fertilizer that uh, that you can have a little bit better success with that too is you put that directly on the plant. I'm um, just got to make sure that you're you know cleaned out your sprayer and you're not putting glide down or something with your fertilizer. You know that's something to obviously make sure that your tanks are triple rinsed out and um, they make a tank cleaning solution you can use as well for that. Um, but uh, some people actually do. Like for clover plots, for example, will grass kill, like like fescue or something like that. They're getting into a clover plot, spray that out with a grass selective like clethodum, and fertilize at the same time. You can do that in the same tank. You know, just check your labels, obviously. Just you know, 
do it as you have to do it by law. But so you can do that in kind of a, a one pass application to get rid of your grasses in a clover plot. Um, but again, like you said, keeping an idea of what you got around you because if you're spraying clethodum, uh, corn is a grass, believe it or not. So you will toast your farmer's corn. If you're you got corn downwind of where you're spraying some clethodum, you could toast some corn. Um, any of your winter wheat, cereal rye, any of that stuff, you'll toast that, milo, sorghum that they've you know been maybe planting for cow silage or something like that, they'll toast that too. So mm -hmm. just keep in mind what you got around you when you're uh, spraying and uh It's always good spray to spark. have, uh, you know, same thing with hunting. You want to think of your wind direction, you know, when you're out there spraying and fertilizing and everything else, you know, kind of keep the same thought, which direction is the overspray and overcast going to go, you know. Yeah, but no. So one of the topics that I saw actually, just speaking of it, um, can't remember. I don't think it was in the New York Outdoor News. I think I saw it posted on the DEC's Facebook page. Is we're going, uh, I guess, a throwback, if you want to call it a throwback. But New York's getting new licenses for this upcoming year. No more vinyl paper. It's uh, going to be regular old, good old loose leaf paper. For licenses now. Oh, great. So you can supposedly print your license off at home if you've ordered it online to avoid uh, delivery delays and stuff like that or losing them in the mail. Mm -hmm. um, uh, or like this year, they couldn't get any of the vinyl paper, so there was an issue with uh, the colors or whatnot with uh, being the same as the previous year's mm -hmm. licenses. So um, figure out a way to keep them dry. Yeah, make sure you're definitely keeping them dry. Um, back tags, I'm, I'm a little bit more worried about than, you know, some of the other ones because some of them get taken in and out during the season, you know, for bow season versus gun season and all that other stuff. But, uh, yeah. In a Ziploc, Ziploc bag. Keep your tags in a Ziploc bag and your tag. Yep. And get one of the nice ones. Don't just get, like, a press and seal. Get, like, an actual, like, zipper Ziploc, you know. Yeah. Keep them a little bit more weather tight than the dollar store specials. I mean, you could go all out. They got those uh, waterproof foam cases. Yeah. Have a little waterproof thing that you shove oh, all this stuff. And then you turn the little snaps on it. it yeah. Yep. Little hydro packs or whatever they call them kayaker, for like kayakers. Kayakers, yeah. Yeah. Yep. Uh, do people tag their deer in New York? Bow hunt comments in. Drop that on the, the drop line down there. They're supposed to. By law, you're supposed to. <laughs> um, like always, we obviously highly encourage people. Uh, to call in their deer and report their deer. Sometimes I know the system can be challenging and yeah, it's definitely gotten better with the app. It, it's the, the app has been better than the, the first year I in. had the app. The app was messy too, but it seems like this past couple of years they've straightened it out. Mm -hmm. So um, I still think that we're somewhere below 50%, they believe recording rate. Um, was it like 42 or 46? I think it was like 40 something. Um, so yeah, I think it's, I mean, maybe 50 on the high side, we'll say, you know, um, I do think it's getting better, but, uh, and like we say, the reasoning behind that is to, to help the state make as much of an informed decision as they can, especially with stuff like, uh, issuing for doe tags and other stuff like that. If you're not calling in these reports, um, the state can't get an accurate, you know, reading of what's coming out of the woods or as, as accurate of a reading as what's coming out of the woods. So, um, yeah, both come out over 50% of people don't report their deer. Yeah. That was the last one. I think, like you said, 42, 46, something like that sticking in my head yeah. too, um, for what they believe the reporting rate is for, for tags in New York. So it's pretty low. Um, I don't know if a paper change is going to change that, but, no. um, like I said, we'll always encourage folks to do it. We do it um, mostly because we're posting the deer also on Facebook that we are harvesting too. So, you know, it's, I mean, it would be kind of nice if, I mean, the app's nice and everything. I mean, if New York put like a little, one of those little scan cues, you just put your camera over, you click it, and, like and it, QR. Bring, yeah, it brings up everything for you, and you just da -da 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 -da, do it right there and submit it. Yeah. I mean, that the would QR be code of, could be up. handy. Logging onto the app, going mm -hmm. through, answering all the questions individually. Yeah. 
Like it is a little bit of a process, but it's really not. Well, and I've been I've been a firm believer too with that that uh, you know um, it's almost like a little checkbox thing. And it was some things we had with different forms when I've done paperwork back when I was with the DEC when we were doing site evaluation forms. Like it wouldn't let you go to the next section of it without filling it out. So almost similar to that, it wouldn't let you buy like this year's hunting license if you didn't re report your harvest from last year. Even if you harvested zero deer, I think there's a lot better ways the state could be monitoring that, um, you know, or encouraging that. Even if it was like a lottery, a giveaway, something, something to incentivize it, you know, other than just, you know, we need to report it as the law. And obviously you got to follow the rules it is the law and we definitely recommend that, but, you know, for jq public with some of that you know they're like well i got my tag i'm still legal i tagged it but they didn't report it you know so i think you gotta uh gotta report them dude and i know like i, I said know a lot of processors um at least some of the processors around here they actually ask you after you, when you drop your deer off did you report your tag mm -hmm. Because and that could be they do reminder. have random DC checks that show up, and you know it's a good reminder, but it's still not a bulletproof thing. Because then DCs pop into these processors, well-known processors will go through check tags, and I think you have seven days, seven to ten days to report. I think, I think it's, it's I, like I think it's that. seven days after the harvest to report your tag. Yeah, usually I like to report it. Um, the day of that way i don't forget about it either yeah usually um, the day of or the next day i'll report it mm -hmm. yeah yeah usually if you're starting to work it up that next day if you let it hang overnight yeah um yeah but it's which we usually do in the deer shed yeah we're all in there admire the tell the story and yep <laughs> tell the story and you know some days we're getting to work on breaking them down yeah so but yeah, I thought that was kind of neat. And that's the first I'd heard about it, but uh, makes sense. You know, I guess I, I probably would cut less, cost. Cut cost, less money in New York. Because I mean, New York is not a big mm -hmm. environmental, wow, sportsman friendly state. In a lot of ways. In a lot of ways. So mm -hmm. I can see how they would want to cut costs there. Yeah, that was actually. tend to do things. That was actually one of the suggestions we had for a guest on an upcoming show would be Jeremy Hurst, who's the New York State uh, deer biologist, the head biologist for the deer deer program for the state. So it's been a couple of years since I've talked to Jeremy, so I don't know if he'd be interested in coming on or I don't know if he's still doing it or not anymore either. Couldn't tell you if he's the head biologist anymore. I have to reach out to him and see. Yep. Yeah, probably just a quick little Google search away for that. But... <clears throat> other than that what other habitat stuff we got going on we do have some areas that we pushed out did we talk about that last episode we haven't talk, talked about any of that i haven't been on since that yeah right yeah it was that it was the week before it was the last time i was on mm -hmm. gotcha but yeah we got the got the tractor out there ben was generous enough to help me out for an afternoon um got some field edges pushed back that were pretty well overgrown um did a little did a little hinge cutting, some wood cutting. Cleaned up the field edges for you. We definitely got those field edges cleaned up. Definitely don't wanna try and put the hundred proof mix in where we push those field edges back. Cleaned up that old logging road in there. The old logging road. Yeah, and um I did it we I did actually go out and move a couple tree stands. Cause uh the way we actually altered tried basically pinching the deer down more to try bringing them in closer and that's kind of the whole idea i have with um uh, this frost seeding and redoing this old grass field that the farmer gets eight to ten round bales out of a year mm -hmm. it's a 1.8 acre field and uh my whole idea is to try and um, make the more desirable food closer to the field edge to try and feed the deer to me. And then with some of the tree work that we went in and we did with um, getting, rid dropping, of ash and... getting rid of some of the dead ash and utilizing some of those limbs and 
um, logs to actually try and block off um, unwanted deer trail movements to try and pinch them up closer to where I am able to uh, get a shot at them, be able to hunt them instead of, I don't know how many times, and I'm sure everybody deals with this, and it's so annoying, especially in bow season, when you're sitting there and the deer just file out to the middle of the field and you right. just sit there till dark and then you got to figure out how you're going to get out of there without spooking these <laughs> right. deer and it, it's so doing a little bit of work to try and better um access and um departure and trying to get the deer to feed closer to the actual wood line where i'll actually mm -hmm. i'm set up yeah no, I think it'll be good. Like I said, if anybody saw our post on the Hunter Proof page and stuff like that, the picture of us with the freezing cold tractor and snow I, on the ground. Hey, I hold true because if I ask you to help me with anything, it's either the hottest day of the summer or the coldest day of the winter. And I had, what was the coldest day we had this winter? The so coldest far? day, I see. The old LS was I more coarse than though, man. Consistent. Yeah. Hot or cold. <laughs> <laughs> no, I love it. Uh, Bo's comment, really long one. I don't know if this is going to show up all over the screen. Oh, yeah, it sure does. Cuts our heads off, though. Bo says, trying something a little different. My wife wanted to go to the outlets in Waterloo. He's right down the road from us. Bo, you're right in town, and he didn't come say hey. Man, you're like Waterloo Outlet. You're like 10 minutes from my house. Yeah, 10, 15 minutes. Um, noticed there was tons of honey locust pods on the ground there. I picked up a bunch of them and brought them home. I'm trying to get get them started in a pot right now. I think honey locust trees would be an awesome addition to my property if I can get them to grow. Um, so you just have them in like a water pot and you're trying to probably got them in a get seed them to pot. root? Just, yeah, probably going to germ them over. Um, I'd probably just fridge them, make sure that they stay, you know, don't get too wet and get molded out, but uh, fridge them and then um, pot them up. Or if you want to just pot them up and leave them outside, I mean, that would work too. Um, to get them to germinate, but locusts can be, uh, they can be a blessing and they can be a curse. Depends on what your, your goal is to have them for. Um, I know a lot of Good people, bedding. I know a lot it's of people, cover. I know a lot of people like to have them around for, uh, they say, browse on them pretty heavy too. They, they say for the, the winter pod forage, that's, I think what he's saying with the winter pods. Um, you know, so yeah, it's, it's tough to say, um, forget which one are the yeah the honey locusts so those are the bigger potted ones the ones that you'll see um black locusts are the smaller pods but like the big like banana pod looking ones those are honey locusts mm -hmm. um so yeah so and a lot of people like down in illinois and stuff like that say that they feed on them a lot um in the winter time i don't know if that's because uh because that's the only thing that's there actually funny thing um now that Bo's comment clicked in my head uh the new lease over in Clyde, there's a couple honey locusts tucked down in a couple of the spots. And it was big bean pads. And there was, yep. And there was a doe that was actually chewing on one in one of the pictures the other day. So maybe there's something to it, Bo. Hey. But yeah, next time you're uh out this way, man. You'll have to uh have to swing in. Keep us updated on that. Or let project. us know. Yeah, no, that'd be cool definitely to know. Yeah, I just have black locusts on our, our property. We don't have any honey locusts with the big pods like that. So so kind of getting into the tree subject. Mm -hmm. Good segue. Um, you you were talking about getting some tree orders in like you do every year. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have no idea what kind of saplings um, my place of employment is giving out. But just for Arbor Day, there you can sign up to get a few free saplings they're just giving them away for you to take home and plant so i signed up for it i have no idea what they're giving away they did not specify a species but we'll uh we'll see so i might have a couple right. saplings to throw right. somewhere <laughs> yeah yeah no you should have everybody that works on your thing that doesn't want them or when right. garlock at the end of the day is like hey what are we gonna do with all these extra trees be like no nah, don't throw them in the dumpster rich the guy i work with he said uh he goes nah i don't need one I was like, well, I'm just going to mark you down for one. You just give it to me. He's like, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah. So, 
Uh, Bo had a good comment right here. And this is a little inside trick of the trade with it. Um, Saratoga Nursery sold out of Norway Spruce to try to get some. Uh, assuming Bo is going to try to get some uh, trees from that. So if you go to um, a surrounding county or your soil and water district, usually they're going to have a tree and a shrub sale. Wayne County's is going on right now. Um, I kind of roughed out what I think I want to order. It's not a very big order this year. Um, just because I know I won't have the availability because when the trees come in, I will have a newborn. Mm -hmm. So that's going to change things, obviously. And I'm thinking about this ahead of time enough. Yeah. Um, so, and again, if we have, a, especially if we have an early spring this year, uh, it'll be challenging to get those trees in the ground before they start flooding out. We got um, some stuff um, from uh, the Wayne County. Mm-hmm. Thing. I mean, they're cheap. You just go pick them up, and they just tell you your order's ready. You go grab yep. it. Yep, and everything's sourced through Saratoga. Um, and, uh, pretty simple. And they, they do fish for ponds. They do Yep, they do the fish sale, Flowers. Too. They don't just do trees and stuff. They do yeah. a little bit of everything. Yeah, there's trees, shrubs, flowers. There's uh, uh, wildflower seed packs you can order. Um, and if you're not in Wayne County, um, Cayuga County, I know, is very active, too, around us. Seneca County is pretty active. I think Ontario does as well. I don't think I follow their Facebook, so I don't know, don't know if they're. Mm -hmm. um, but being Wayne County is closer to the pieces of property that I hunt. That's the one I typically use because mm -hmm. I can make a little loop that day and take them right there and do that kind of stuff. But I actually have a bunch of uh, <clears throat> red oaks that I potted up last year that are ready to get planted and or you know sold or you know given away or vice versa. So. Um, but if you, like Bo's saying, if you went to the Saratoga site and they show that they're sold out, I'd recommend going to a county local nearby to you, their soil and water district, and seeing if they have them in stock. They're the ones that probably bought them all. Yeah, they did. <laughs> they did. All the other ones are uh, um, the ones that do it. Yeah, look into your local county. Bo says I'll have to look into Herkimer County. Um, yeah, look into surrounding counties, and sometimes you might have to. Uh, Herkimer. Herkimer. And then other times too, they have that's people, a, and that's the other thing that's too. A drive to Waterloo. Yeah, that's out Utica. Utica, I think, is in Herkimer County. Mm -hmm. Out that way. Pretty so, through it though. Yeah, out that way. Um, and that's one of the things too, if you get in with one of the soil and waters, like I know Drew over there at Soil and Water. Actually, one of the things that made me think of this when I was browsing the, the sales site or whatever today was. Um, uh, it would be kind of cool to have Drew on the podcast and talk about like the tree and the program and the soil and water conservation district to have him down for an episode or something like that. So um, that's what kind of sparked in my head today. So, but with the, uh, with the tree orders, yeah, we don't, I don't plan on ordering a whole bunch more like a few red buds for the backyard. Um, I think Hannah talked about getting a few more fir trees for future Christmas trees here at the property. Um, some of the pollinator seed packs for some of the wildflowers she wants me to put out there by the road this year. Stuff like that. Just a couple little small things this year. Not like past years where at one year I bought a couple hundred of this, a couple hundred of that, and I was out there double barring a bunch of trees in everywhere. <laughs> or putting them in pots like last year. That was the other thing is I just started putting them in pots last year. But um, yeah, so talk to your local soil and water and figure out who's running the seed sale too because you might be able to get some trees that uh, weren't picked up or um, they have like with an online order form like Wayne County, sometimes there's a improper data entry. So they end up like they ordered 100, but Saratoga sent them 150 or something like that. Mm -hmm. So at the end of it, they'll reach out to the people that ordered those tree species and be like, hey, do you want an extra, you know, 10 trees or 20 trees of this species because you ordered some and they're, you know, this price. And usually they're actually a little bit cheaper, but you don't know what you're ever going to get. So like I said, just a couple little, little tips and tricks there for the, the tree orders going, going forward this time of the year. But yeah, check with your local, local soil and water because uh, like I said, they're pretty cheap buck. Buck fifty a piece, I think. Yeah, a couple bucks a piece. Maybe a couple bucks for some of the other ones. Uh, some of the soil and water districts actually do fruit trees as well. They're they're a few more dollars for a pot of fruit trees. Naturally. Yep. Um, but yeah, so they have tubes. They have 
um, basically anything. They have water bags typically for if you want to put water bags on them. I don't usually like those because they've found that they uh, girdle trees. I've never used them personally, but like those water bags that they kind of sit on there, mm-hmm. they almost end up like girdling the trees, I've noticed. My client pieces where they've tried to use them. I've noticed that before. Um, yeah, tree tubes are a must, especially if it's something that deer like to chew on, which is most things. So tree tubes are, are a huge one. I like my son Owen. He was gnawing on a pine cone earlier today. Must be having a hard winter. Yeah, he, <laughs> on, he goes, looks at me, goes, mmm. I'm like, no, not me. <laughs> No, I don't think that's that good. He's a little squirrel. <laughs> squirrel child. <laughs> Starting to look like one with his buck teeth coming in. Oh, yeah, got the front teeth rocking. He's, got, he's almost he's got teeth all over the place. Yeah. But, yeah, so that's the thing with the tree orders. Do. <clears throat> if there's something you're looking for, even if it's around the house or you're hunting property, you know, they can help you out with that. And Like I said, don't be afraid to, uh, you know, talk to the people at Soil and Water because they might call up the next – extension and be like hey do you guys have a bunch of bunch of this too and you know do some of that legwork for you too to get a couple a couple dozen extra trees or whatever you're looking for to help you out too because again they want to see you get them out there and get planted as well yep but and if anybody's looking for red oak i have some red oaks that are out in the pot that are nice three four footers now so ones i wanted to get planted last year but again ran out of time when spring came early last year too 100 proof red oak 100 proof <laughs> <laughs> Underproof red oaks, of course, of course. So, yeah. Other than that, um, I like to trim my apple trees here at the house. Um, Want to release some oaks at the farm, but that's that's a pretty big undertaking, and um, I gotta get my my foot feeling better. I don't know. Release? Well, right. You mean clear out around them? Yep. Knock the vines off. Of you them. got it. Yep. Yeah, get the clean them up, clean up around them, and uh, give them some room to grow. Yeah, yeah, because uh, I was talking about that. Um, I don't know, a couple of shows ago, I think. Um, and we just we don't have a lot of oaks on the on the property, the main property, I don't know. And actually, I don't know if I have any oaks on my grandmother's at all. Maybe one or two up on the east side of it. But that's a not a very predominant uh, oak parcels out there, and then I don't think the lease we have has any oaks on it either. Not that I've ever seen walnuts. Squirrels love the walnuts out there. I had a walnut, big squirrels, <laughs> big squirrels. Jesse's tuning in. Yeah, hammer squirrels. I you know, have competition this year. Yeah, there's a. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yep. Uh, Bo says, remember the last podcast you mentioned sawtooth oak. Is there a timeline before they start to drop acorns? So my sawtooths have started to produce. It's not very many, um, but they have started to produce. And I got them when I started doing Old Tin Cup. I think it was like the first year I was starting to do that because I was in my apartment in Bloomfield when I started Old Tin Cup. So, and that's when I got the trees from uh Ben Lau down there at Meadowview Tree Nursery. Also, if you are looking for a local nursery supplier, Meadowview Tree Nursery down in Naples, New York, is another one I would highly recommend. Um, they're a good, uh, a good, good choice as well. Beautiful drive out there too. Yep, beautiful drive down there just before you get into Naples. Um, coming on the uh, would that be the west side of town? Coming down, yeah, east side comes down through Middlesex. So mm-hmm. west side on the west side coming down through. Of you tree nurse, we've been there since oh, 90s, maybe, maybe earlier. I'm not sure. I know Ben's been in charge of it now for the last six, eight years or better. So, yeah, I think he's full owner now. I think he bought out the other partners on it. So, good for him. Yep. Yep. Actually, I should get down to see Ben. I haven't seen him in a while. But yeah, so sawtooths, I've had, I have some that are producing. They've been um, planted for about 10 years now, I'd say. So, um, they're definitely getting there, you know, but yeah, or gobbler oaks. Some people call them gobbler oaks too, because of the smaller acorns that turkeys can eat them. They're like a smaller kind of acorn usually. Hmm. Um, 
But yeah, doesn't the the leaf doesn't really look like an oak. It kind of looks like long, long kind of lanceolate shaped leaf with a little bit of um, kind of jagged edges down it. Hence the name sawtooth. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Um, but yeah, no, they're pretty, pretty cool trees. Um, again, tube them because the deer love to eat them. Um, so that's another tip for seeing this from experience. Yeah, yep, yeah, seeing them on other pieces and stuff like that, and where they get. Excuse me, on the top of a tube. If it's not like a five footer, um, and out of deer height for the most part, uh, they're they're gonna get after them. So, yeah, the uh, any oak species, pretty much any of the maple species, pretty much any deciduous tree species this time of the year, meaning anything that's not evergreen, is gonna be pretty much something that a deer is gonna chew on. Mm -hmm. um, especially if you, especially if you put it right down in their face in the spring <laughs> they're gonna they're gonna find it especially if they got fresh earth you know how that is with a fresh tilled field anything like that and they, go out, they gotta check it out they gotta check it out the roots and everything else that fresh that fresh disturbed dirt man they gotta gotta stick their nose in it but yeah so what else we got looking for land yeah so um, a lot of people have been reaching out to me um, about trying to find leases um, this time of the year. And the best kind of advice I can uh, give to give them with it is um, you got to find somebody to build that relationship with it. Some of the, uh, the leasing websites and stuff like that are tough um, because one, you might not find something that's in your area readily. Because, you know, kind of typically in this area, stuff doesn't hit those sites. It just doesn't get leased. Like, usually the stuff that's coming up on those sites is down in the southern tier. Um, so that's that's kind of changing stuff a little bit. But uh, I would also say don't overlook some of the, um, the, the public land. And also, if you do find a good piece of land, um, you know, take care of it you know, respect it, all that stuff. Don't do something silly and get yourself thrown off of it for a stupid reason. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, so yeah, I think kind of looking for land this time of year is a big one. So I wanted to dive into that a little bit and see what your, your take on it or is any advice, any tips. Cause on your side of it, you have permission, you have lease, you know, you don't really have a lot of family ground or nothing. So yours is more permission or lease. So I thought this would kind of fit a good, good segue for you for explaining um, some tips yeah you uh you touched on it the biggest part is uh being respectful um just you know good woodsmanship um try and leave it kind of the way you found it unless you have permission to alter something um building relationships with the landowner i mean that's how i um came upon my lease that i've had for a few years now um became really good friends with the landowner and stuff like that but uh in the past um i have knocked on some doors um i've never really had a ton of money in my life <laughs> so for me to dish out four or five grand to lease a piece of property for years just out of the question um i was i've always been willing to trade labor if they have um, a project around their house or they burn wood i've split wood i've uh pack bunk and run tractor and run tractor pack bong uh yeah all sorts of stuff basically um, I, I've, I've back when i was really big into coon hunting i've got rid of some raccoons that people were having problems with bring my dog back there and mm -hmm. knock out a few raccoons for them um, so that's, that's something that's really helped me. But the biggest thing is just being respectful, getting to know people and, uh, just building that relationship with them. Um, if you are someone who has extra money to spend, I mean, that's definitely a solid option to get a piece. Mm -hmm. Um, but those are, those are the main ways that I've actually come around. I mean, my grandfather had a lot of relationships with some farmers around because he's a he's an old farmer mm -hmm. and uh, i would go and talk to him and be like hey i'm you know 
Bill Sinek's grandson. He's like, oh, yeah, we know Bill. And I get to talk to him. I'm like, I'm curious about hunting. Is there anything I could trade to mm -hmm. possibly get permission to hunt this piece? Um, labor, um, maybe a small amount of money. Sometimes you might be able to sneak in for a year for a few hundred bucks. Yep. But the biggest thing is building the relationship for me. And uh, um, I always try and butter them butter uh steve up every year i try and get him a nice little christmas present for letting me hunt mm -hmm. he likes his whiskey so this year I got him that engraved um uh, bottles we were doing yep. i got his private stock and his farm engraved on it mm -hmm. so he kind of uses it as a little party container now he breaks it out yeah. and so he really like that just try and you know, be good to him and yeah yeah. Show that you're appreciative and try not to disrespect no, too much at, at all, really. <laughs> yeah, anything they're doing, yeah, accidents happen, but you know, if it does fix it, that yeah, just you know, yep. yeah, happen to do something, just make sure you go in there and you correct it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, I think, like you said, treating it like it's look at your own or better than your own, you know, is, is huge. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, just always asking permission to do everything even if you are 99.9 .9 sure it's not mm -hmm. going to be an issue just still make the phone call or swing into their house and be like hey i was thinking of doing this putting this stand here I don't yeah. want to upset anybody if this is going to cause any problems mm -hmm. i want you to tell me now yep and if you don't mind even if it's as simple as cutting a tree up or anything <laughs> yeah. just ask. taking down this just take know, the time to ask shoot before lane. you do something yep yeah i think that's a huge thing too or put a new stand up you know you go out there and start harvesting his crops and there's five brand new stands out there and he's like yeah, how many guys are hunting out here? yeah how many guys are hunting out here you know you, you said you're gonna put up a couple stands now there's like 10 of them out here like you know mm -hmm. just it's yep. always good to just double check have and, that open dialogue yeah because I even run into it, too, where people don't know that pieces get sold just because they don't have open dialogue with the owners and stuff like that. They got permission the old, once. Uh, and yeah. yeah, and they never ask permission again. Ask permission every year. Don't mm -hmm. just assume. Yep. You can go out there. I always, a... I always check with Steve yep. and some of the other pieces. Hey, is it still all right? You just swing in and chat with them for a minute. Mm -hmm. Or just reach out through a text, whatever is most convenient. Yep. So... Just so they're aware of what you're doing out there. And if you you are the one that has a lease and you want to bring a friend out or anything, just be like, call them. Be yeah. like, hey, is it all right if Ben comes out hunting with me this weekend? You know, mm -hmm. I don't want to step right. on anybody's toes. or yep. yeah, People can be funny show, sometimes. Don't and, show up with four or five trucks deep. and Yeah, yep. that'll be a problem because that's actually how – a uh, hunting piece. It was 30 acres, but it's a solid pinch point. And I saw a ton of deer and killed a ton of deer out there, but that's actually how I acquired a piece. Uh, the person that previously had uh, permission to be out there um, uh -huh. overstepped their bounds and they ended up going out there doing a huge drive without asking permission. Yeah. And the guy's sitting up in his house and he sees all these orange jackets walking through his woods. And he's like, what the hell? So he goes down there and, mm -hmm. you know, ended up kicking the guy out. Like, nah, so we don't like this. We don't like pushing the deer. We don't like this many people out here. We feel it's dangerous, blah, blah, blah. Yep. And, yep. And make oh, sure yeah. you establish when you do get permission, your seasons. Well, your seasons and, you know, don't assume that they're letting you deer hunt it that you can turkey hunt it yeah yeah you just establish all the rules get everything out in the open right in the beginning mm -hmm. it's it's gonna save you a whirl of headaches yep and it'll help you keep that piece yep. for a few more years yeah i got a uh, i got a little lease agreement document i usually work up even if it's a permission piece usually i write it up um, you know state and like you said black and white stuff you can deer hunt turkey hunt shed hunt you know, exclusively posted if, you know, with the landowner, some of them want, them, want it posted, mm -hmm. you know, as well when you, you know, kind of take over the management side of it. And some and some don't want to see it posted either. Some of them will come up with rules that you find are goofy. Yep. Um, I, <laughs> I had a piece I was hunting 
Um, for the first couple of years, um, I didn't establish the rule that I wasn't allowed to shoot doe. And this is early on in my hunting career. I'm out there hunting, and I shoot a doe opening weekend of uh, rifle season. And I gutted her, dragged her out. Well, apparently his wife found out or saw that I shot a doe, and she didn't like that. So he was decent enough. He came out, and he was like, listen, Nate, you know, wife wasn't really too happy about the dough. Mm -hmm. um, you know, just no more dough, right? Yep. Well, and then I shot another deer years later or whatever. Their beagle went out there and got into the gut pile. And a new rule acquired. I, have, I cannot leave the gut pile on the property. I need to either... Um, take it off. Take or... the deer off and gut it off of their property or gut it there and take the gut pile with me because the dog went out there, ate it, went in their house, yes, uh... puked all over their house, and it was disgusting. Yeah. And the, they, they were always good to me. They always explained things to me. Mm -hmm. You know, we were friends, built that relationship, and they, you know, gave me multiple chances. And those just those little things, little mistakes that yeah. you make that you do, wouldn't think, like leaving a gut pile in the woods. Right. That's a couple hundred yards away from the house. You wouldn't think. Yeah. It'd be an issue. Yep. Ah, the coyotes or fox will have it all cleaned up from the birds or whatever. Beagle found it first. Yeah. yeah. Well, <laughs> and then just some of the rules that you're going to have to go through just to be able to maintain permission. And sometimes you just feel that it's too much of a hassle and you don't want to deal with it. But, and I would say this that uh, we if gotta, they have the rules, right. you should probably follow. <laughs> right. I want to get, uh, I want to get this last little thing out. And then we got a couple comments that came in that I want to get to. But, kind of case in point two. If it is like a pain in the butt, you know, too much of a hassle, you know, or whatever, or it's not worth it. If you do have a financial investment to it, you find that it's not worth that to you anymore or whatnot. Mm -hmm. um, Something better comes up. You know, yeah. Time. Yeah. Or you got to, you know. Don't just ditch it. Yeah. Well, and the same thing, too, is that's what I was just going to say is our buddy Keith is looking at walking away from a permission piece, not a piece that he's financially invested into either. He's like, well, the hunting's not that good on it anymore. And I'm like. Is it just that the woods is changing and you're trying to hunt it the same way and that's why it's not as good? Or, you know, what's the what's the reasoning behind this? You know, rather than just say, well, a bad year, doesn't hunt good anymore, throw in the towel on it. It's a free permission piece. Look a little deeper than it on the surface, too. Don't throw away, you know, ground because ground's getting harder to come by. Because if you throw it away, someone's going to move right in. Mm-hmm. And then later on, you're going to find out that you're kind of might be wishing you still had that piece. Oh, 100%. Dude. And I think that that's, you know, a good point is, you know, keep keep a good thing. And like you said, keep that relationship good and, you know, it'll work out. Uh, Bo's comment was more crossbow hunters equals more leases. That's an interesting thought. Um, and then he says the reason is a lot of states have implemented crossbows throughout archery season has also caused an increase in leasing because most go gun hunters who used to hunt only during gun season might not have considered leasing. However, as they transition into crossbow and hunting for an entire season, this is increased leasing basically because of the increased amount of days available afield. So the investment, I guess, per hunt or whatever is worth it now to a lot of folks. That's a good point. I guess I didn't think about it that way. I can see that. I can see that, you know, rather than if you were just a, a firearm hunter or something like that, or um, typically leases I've known of in the past, um, most of them have been like a family that leases the piece, you know, like a family or a group or something like that that leases a piece. Because yeah, um, most people are blue collar workers like us. We yeah. Afford five thousand dollars a year. Yeah, that's true. I mean, you know, and then there's a lot of people too that with some of the cost of some of these leases, like you said, um, you know, we're taking that money instead and going on an out of state hunt every year. You know, so there's different routes to go with it and stuff like that for sure. But, um, but yeah, that's a good, interesting point, boy. I didn't think of it like that, that, uh, you know, because I've just always hunted archery and gun as well, you know, but that I, does make sense if you were just a firearm hunter that, you know, and that's things I've run into too. I mean, asking permission, they're like, well, so and so hunts it, and I'll ask them, well, do they bow hunt it or do they just gun hunt it? If they just gun hunt it, can I have it for bow season? Yep. Can I go out there and bow season? Mm -hmm. Then also be respectful to your 
the hunters you're also sharing the property with don't just go climb up in their stand because you're able to hunt the piece i mean just be respectful to their stuff their equipment and everything and kind of have your own yeah little thing going because that'll cause waves well and the other thing is too and this is just this is an etiquette thing going along the lines of what you said too is is don't undercut people either you know to the best of your ability mm -hmm. you know like deliberately undercutting somebody unless there's something that's like blatantly wrong with the other individual or something like that like you know doing something that's not legit or legal or you know if they're just being you know mis mistreatful of the property or just being a, a jerk about stuff mm -hmm. you know but other than that you know don't don't undercut somebody and especially if you get invited to somebody's spot don't undercut them that's i think that's one of the dirtiest yeah, things in. that's one of the dirtiest spot. things in the world dude to me you know yeah. so i went through some of that with a fishing spot <clears throat> fishing spots are bad for it oh man i remember at least bullhead fish all the time i remember i took a bunch of my friends out to the spot my grandfather showed me and it was a nice little spot and back dirt road and uh, it was the uh, Clyde River, off the Clyde River. Mm -hmm. And it was back in the woods a little ways. You could get a little fire going. You could have a couple beers, and you could fish and maybe yep. cook something. You could, you know, hang out. You could have a little party while you're bullet fishing, basically. Yeah, have a little this nice what overnight. That's what we used to do. Well, one night, none of my friends were with me. Me and I think my dad were going to go out bullet, but I'd drive up to my spot. And there's all my friends over there fishing. And they never even, like, contact me well who i thought was my friend at the right time. and it did it was a burn it was a burn i i let him know yeah. i was like what the hell man I, mean, I showed you the spot now you're coming here using it and yeah the new you didn't even invite me the new <laughs> the new the new fishing spot i think is turkey hunting too yeah. you know that's another one that i've seen a lot of folks you know get invited somewhere and then they jump in over the top on it yeah you know and not just be respectful to people Mm -hmm. I mean, things happen. People do things. But. Yeah. Live and learn. Yeah, absolutely. Had a, I think, first time commenter, Jerry Dilgard. A little Tasmanian devil for his Facebook profile picture. I like that. Uh, how far are your normal rifle shots? It's a good question. 100, 150. Uh, farthest I've shot. Average would probably be under 50. Um, but I would say, depends on your I, I, yeah, it depends on where I'm hunting, too. That, that's mean, a big part of it. True, I mean, True. a lot of my permission pieces of the rifle season, I know I could accurately shoot. I'm well, and not pound it either with, with getting like, in deep you know, into it. within 200 yards of where the deer are coming out, and I feel comfortable that they're going to feed to me and I'm going to get that 130 yard shot before legal lights yeah. up, you know? Yeah. So I, a lot of times I'd go in with my seat mm -hmm. and I just sit just to tuck in some weeds with my sticks and I'll, I won't even sit my tree stands because majority of my tree stands are set up for bow season. I don't want to low bump anything and low impact and I can hunt from a distance and not disturb anything, mm -hmm. like really minimize my risk of negatively no, impacting my hunt. That's a good point. Um, yeah, I would say, dude, anything under that 150 yards feels like a, a wheelhouse chip shot, you know, for the most part. Yeah. If I got, especially if I got like a trigger stick, something like that, yeah. let alone if I'm out the window of a blind or off of a tree, something really steady. I mean, honestly, <laughs> if, if I feel like I can, the shot's going to be, 80 yards or under, I'll just bring my shotgun. <laughs> yeah, that's true, <laughs> you know too. I mean? You know, and I have... Like, a lot of your food plot setups, mm -hmm. I would just bring my 20-gauge. Yeah, you don't need to. Because, because the way you have it laid out and the way they're set up, they're really set up for both shots. I mean, you're going to have a 50 to 70-yard shot easily on a deer. I would say... Unless you get out on, like, the power line or something like that. Right, I mean, it's... Yeah, something a little different, but... Unless you're on the power line, I would say farther shot in a single food plot, unless you're shooting like down the power line to a different one, would probably be across from mom and dad's 120 yards, maybe from end to end. Yeah, and I mean my <laughs> my 20 you know? gauge with the red dot on it and the candelabered barrel and those sabots, things just as accurate as a all rifle day, all day. You know, I'm 
you know, you're shooting baseball sides groups easily at a hundred yards. Yep. I've seen them do it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Follow up question coming in from Jerry. What calibers do you use? Um, I'm 270. I'm uh, rifle 65. Yep. And then uh, and, uh, shotgun. I've always ran my 20 gauge Remington 870. I haven't run a shotgun in a bunch of years now, basically since I got the 270. The first 270. I got the Remington semi auto 270. Um, the only reason I won't don't run that as much is I don't know if it's got a compression issue or something, but it doesn't like to eject shells when it's cold. I don't know if they heave up in the barrel or something or whatever, but that's the only reason I don't run that semi-auto Remington 270 I got, but both of mine are 270s and then handgun 357. Um, then muzzle loader, we both shoot CVAs. I think they're even the same, same model. Optima V2. Yep. 50 cals. Honestly, so. I would just hunt with my muzzle loader all year round. If it was, I'm, I'm, I'm comfortable. Like a lot of these, 150 states, yards of that muzzle loader. Yeah, like a lot of these states that are, um, that are shotgun or muzzle loader only, and you can't use rifle. I would probably, if that's what, how New York was, like I'd if it was all year, what ten years ago or whatever before rifle was around. I, yeah. Now that I know that that CVA will do it, 200 yards. Yeah. Um, you know, I I would hunt with that over a rifle. Really, if I was hunting field situation or. Um, something with a longer stretched yardage, but now that we can use rifle, I do like that 270 a lot. But I haven't stretched it out to shoot a deer. I think I shot one of Grandma's like a buck 80 with it, but I felt completely comfortable and confident with it. The doe, and I that was that was the Remington. Year. I shot that doe with the Remington actually. The doe I shot last year, um, that we let sit for a couple hours. We came and we did the podcast and we went back out and recovered her. Mm-hmm. Well, that, that was that was a hundred seventy yard shot by muzzle mm-hmm. And she she was dead, you know. She was dead what within a hundred yards of where I shot her. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Gonna throw the comment up there. Belly feeding them. Oh feeding them. Much out of the belly. Much out of the shirt. Uh, yeah. <laughs> we were actually just talking about Billy before the episode. Yeah. I was talking about a shed fest. I guess it's not going on this year. They're going to do the party. Do the party. Do the party at Windy Brew on Sunday. Uh, I got it in my calendar, Bill. Um, but uh, if you've got that off the top of your head, we post that in the comments. Do for fun. I enjoyed following it and actually participating the past couple of years. That was always fun to follow it on Facebook and see what everybody's throwing up on the page. Yeah, so I'm sure we'll do like... Sheds, deadheads. As long as I got... Uh, uh, I think he's doing April. Is it April, Bill? If you're still, excuse me, still tuning in. I can't. Uh, I, I almost wore my I say, shirt, too. I want to say it's like April 12th or something. I think I put it in my phone. Um, But that's at Windy Brewer out there in Strikers. April 21st, he says. 21st. So, okay. So, I'll be still sleep deprived probably at that point. Yeah, I do have it in here, Bill. April 21st. But uh, Windy Brew. I haven't been able to make it to the party yet, but maybe this year. But uh, yeah, you can bring Owen along. Yeah, but uh, carpool. Yeah, I mean the whole event's fun and following it on Facebook, and I've heard from you and multiple people that the mm-hmm. the party. Yeah, we'll put we'll put my your guys. We'll put, put my on little one when and Owen and yeah. you and me will load up in the pickup and drive out to Windy Brew, yeah. score some deer sheds and yeah. hang out. Yeah. Change diapers. Diapers and deer. Change diapers and uh diapers and deer. All that stuff. That's our life. Bill says well the famous Ben Williams scoring horns. Yeah, I gotta score them horns up. <laughs> I don't know, dude. I've the past couple of times I've scored I've scored muleys, I've scored white tails, elk. I think I scored scored a set of black tail sheds that a guy found when he was out um mule deer hunting. So a whole bunch of stuff. Yeah, hopefully, Bill. I'd be probably a dad for about a month at that point, so I'm hoping to be there. <laughs> Never know. Yeah. So don't throw Billy, me don't throw me on the flyer just yet. Billy's man. got a couple try. Of kids. He knows how it is. Yep. Yeah. Uh, Jerry says, "Have some ammo for you guys. I load both 270 and 65 Creedmoor. Got some custom load rounds. Sweet. I'll take that. Yeah, I was talking to Jerry. Test them out. Um." About that, a couple times, uh, a couple messages last couple last week or so, 
um, talking about the 270 and stuff like that. So pretty cool, man. Yeah, definitely might be. Yeah. yeah, you might have to hit you up for those rounds. Yeah, just to test a few out. Yeah, I wouldn't be Take opposed to. Range. I think we're um actually due probably for a pretty heavy doe harvest this year. So, um, I'm hoping that they come up with uh, a closer donation location for for deer and stuff like that. I know you and me have plenty of you know people we can get a hold of to split a deer even or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I'm trying to. Well, people it's, are crazy, man. Well, During deer season, they find out you got it. If you got any extra, we'll take some. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> they start coming out of the woodwork. And, of course, it's the year where it's, you know, not as it, – it was fine, you know, plenty for me, but it wasn't as flush as some other years necessarily. You got any more of that deer jerky? Jerky. Some always – people always want jerky. Yeah, always yeah, want – Jerky. There's always want the summer that. sausage. Always want yeah. a specialty stuff. stuff. I don't blame them. Well, I, I don't blame them either. It's but, a lot of work to do that stuff, though. Yeah. And when do. you're done and you bag it up, you're like, that's all I got. Yeah. <laughs> do all this batch and stuff like that. But I've gotten it pretty good. I like the I – I didn't do jerky last year. Year before I did. I like the LEM stuff. I probably should get out. I think I still have a little bit left of uh, – I see you got some summer sausage down there. Yeah, that was summer sausage Dad brought over um, that he had made up. But I'm out of the stuff I made. That batch I made with the high temp cheese that it turned out real good. Yeah, I think I got that recipe right. You got the moisture content better. Mm -hmm. I think so. The first year you did it, it was a little on the dry side, but then last year's was definitely a lot better. Yeah, that was um, add another third of water than the recipe called for um, to try to keep that moisture better in it, um, and then just keep sure keep uh, keep on your temp and don't let it go over temped for when it's finished you pull it out when it's hit it so that means sometimes you're pulling sticks out you know ahead of time and then leaving other ones in that just for whatever reason don't want to get to temp mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's how you kind of keep that uniform kind of feel because it's weird like different sticks will cook different speeds and it might be a spot in the oven um yeah. i've always done it in the oven i've never smoked them mm -hmm. so should be, you should make some up and have ryan smoke them I wonder if we could finish them in the smoker, like get them, get them done almost, or like pre-smoke them and then I don't know. Well, yeah, if you run them in the smoker, you just get them up to temp, yeah, and just smoke them down. Hmm. Yeah. Make some up, bring them over to Ryan and smoke them up. Billy says, "Sleep when you're dead." Uncle Dallas can score too. Yeah, I'm sure. There's usually a couple guys there got tapes floating around. We can put some inches to the inches to the bone. Yeah, it was. Uh, it's always a good time. I'll bring a little whiteboard along for the, uh, the little tally for best of and you know best deadhead and stuff like that. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I don't know. Are you gonna be accepting like pictures in Bill throughout shed season, or do you want just folks to use that hashtag ShedFest24, or what do you want to do with that? Because uh, I got one deadhead already, not the one I killed. Or not the one I shot, rather, I should say. Um, thought it was, but that's it wasn't. One. Yeah, he's solid. He's real solid. Jesse was actually talking to me. That's when my phone buzzed during the show earlier. Jesse's saying, he's like, man, he's like, it's a stinking. I'm trying to get the courage up to do it. And I'm like, I know the fish bite's been pretty good, Jesse. It's okay. I know I know you've been out there smacking the fishies around with having no ice on yeah. and nice weather. Yeah. Well, I think, <laughs> I, he's, I think he's laid off right now. But I'm sure it does It's always like a month or... So that his uh, his job lays him off yeah. in the winter, and then they pick back up. Right. So yeah. So we'll uh, we'll pump it up like always. But yeah, send it into uh, Pertnier Outdoors on Facebook or Instagram, or use ShedFest twenty four hashtag in your picture post. Very good. I think that's a good place to end it for the night. About an hour and eight minutes in. Mm -hmm. Looks pretty good. So want to thank everybody for tuning in to the episode. And like always, uh, we'd appreciate it if you subscribe to the channel over on YouTube, um, subscribe to the podcast, uh, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to them. And if you can't find us where you listen to your podcast, let us know and we'll get over there too. Yeah, do our um, best. Yeah, do our best. We're trying. A couple technologically illiterates, but we're working on it. I mean, it's pretty easy. All I just got to hit is a little plus buttons, and we're good to go. So want to thank everybody for this 100 proof white tails again and we couldn't do this without you guys um and we'll catch you all next time down here 
the bar or wherever we're shooting from, really. Yeah. All right, guys. Thanks for checking us out. See ya. R.I.P. Toby Key. R.I.P. Toby Key. <laughs> Toby. Toby. Damn it. I like that guy. I did too, man. Absolutely. That was a bummer. <laughs>